Hey everyone, welcome back to Pseudotech, and welcome to what is finally the last episode of Linux from scratch, kind of tentatively. In this video, we're going to be going over everything in chapter 6, 7, and I think we get to 8. We're going to be booting up the system in this video and getting it all set up with the devices and network and things like that. I'll take you all through it in what I think is a lot more detailed than the book does, because the book is really not that great at this point. I don't know why they couldn't have explained things a bit more. It's easy to understand if you're like really good at Linux, but I'm going to hopefully simplify it down so that you all can understand it because it can be a little bit tricky to follow along with. I say tentatively that it's the last episode because there may be a 12th episode where I cover probably how to move the operating system from the virtual box, which I've been using, to an actual computer. Optimally, you're going to build it on the actual computer that you're going to be using the operating system on, but that wasn't a possibility for me because I don't have a capture card to record video from just a kind of a bare bones system that I would set up. So I had to run it in a virtual machine so that I could record it for you guys to make this tutorial. Anyway, let's get right into the first stripping process, which is stripping again and cleaning up. We're gonna log out of the Linux from scratch system or the true environment, and then we're gonna re-enter it. This just makes sure that all of the things are not being used so that when we strip it, it doesn't cause errors and stuff like that. There's some binaries and libraries that can be safely stripped. And then again, in the cleaning up section, there's just a bunch of files that you're gonna remove. From now on, they give the code. You don't wanna run this now because you're already in the true environment, but they're gonna give you the code to run it in the future because the setup is slightly different for the true environment. So if you log out and log back in again, which by the way is totally fine if you do it at any point in this video, almost any point in this video, you're gonna wanna use the code on the cleaning up page to take care of that. Now we're on to chapter seven, which is system configuration. It goes through a lot of the useful things about how Unix and Linux systems generally work, which is fairly similar across operating system to operating system. It's gonna be how ours works. So you can read the different modes kind of that it's in, which they're actually called run levels. But usually you're in three to five, but of course zero is halt and six would be, you know, like a level over five where you're just rebooting. It's fairly well understood and there's a lot of support on this kind of thing as much as you're gonna get for building an operating system, obviously. The next step is going to be unpacking and installing the LFS boot scripts. So switch over to the sources directory, unpack lfs-boot scripts. You can change the directory and make install it. Then go ahead and get out of the Dutch directory and delete the directory that you created from the tarball. We're not gonna delete the sources directory quite yet because we're gonna need a few other things in it. These are just boot scripts that are provided by Linux from scratch that will work with the Linux from scratch operating system. We're also gonna use them to set a few things up in the future. 7.3 covers the overview of device and module handling. I'm not gonna go into actually anything in this, but this is another section that you should definitely read to kind of understand how this all works. This and actually the next, not really chapter, but section, subchapter, I guess, cover different things about devices and how you can implement them onto your system to, you know, use a device like a drive or a CD drive. For CD-ROMs, there's sim links that they provide to set up. Um, there's ways you can deal with duplicate devices that might be recognized under the same um, kind of address by the operating system. But I'm not going to be using any of these, so there's not any need for me to set these up. The two things that we are going to do on the managing devices section 7.4 is the bash and the cat command. That are the first two commands to create the custom udev rules. Those are necessary, so just run those and you should be good to go. We're going to need the output of the cat file, so don't clear your screen right now. Just keep it on and go ahead to the general network configuration, assuming that you're not going to be setting up any of the other devices on this page. The general network configuration is fairly simple, but it's going to depend on your system a lot. Go ahead and change to etc slash sysconfig and run the cat command to create the ifconfig.eth0 file. This is the pretty general default file to set up the network preferences, but we're going to have to edit it a little bit. So if you check out the output of the cat command that we ran a little bit earlier, you should see a bunch of things like subsystem, drivers, the MAC address, um, and the name, which is what we're looking for. For me, it's ENP0S3. Could be different things for you. This is the address of the network card or the name of the network card. And we're going to rename the file that we just created with the ifconfig.eth0 file to that. So it's going to be ifconfig dot and then the name of your network card. So to do that, just use mv. That's the move command, which technically just moves it, but it's just moving it to a different file name. So just move ifconfig.eth0 to ifconfig dot 
the name. So in my case, this is ifconfig.emp0s3, but it's, again, whatever you got from that cat command up above. Now, the default values of this file might be just fine for you, but I'm going to edit them for me. So you can use vim, so either vi or vim, and then ifconfig.emp0s3, or whatever it's called, or just whatever you renamed it to. Crash course of vim, if you have never used it before, there's a couple different modes. So to get out of the default mode, you can press escape, or to get out of the editing mode, you want to type i to insert stuff, and that basically turns it into a regular text editor. Um, press escape to get into kind of the default mode. I'm not exactly sure what it's called. And then the command mode is a colon. So just the shift and then colon, and that'll get you into a little kind of command prompt thing. You can write Q to quit or write to write or just WQ to write and then quit. We're gonna keep it to on boot equals yes. The interface is gonna be the same thing that we just renamed the file to. So in my case, iface should equal emp0s3. We can skip with IPv4 static, that's just fine for most people. And then for me, I'm just going to replace all the ones with the zeros in the 192.168.1, so that should be dot zero for me. This depends on your router. If you don't know what this is, then, well, it's just the IP address of your router. You can figure out what your IP address is of your current computer by typing iwconfig or ifconfig sometimes, depends on what you have installed in your system. Um, but you, you can kind of model these off of any IP address on your network that you have. So if it's 192.168.1, change all of these to .1. And then the IP should be the IP that you want your LFS system to run on. And this can be anything between 2 and 255. Keep 1 open for the gateway because that's generally the default. The gateway should be 192.168. Usually either 0, 1, dot 1. Um, the prefix you can just keep as the default that it's set to. You can think about the broadcast as the range of what it is, so that's to 255 because that's how many bits you can handle. So you're going to change the first part to what the rest of your thing was and then the maximum value, so this is 255. If you don't really know what to do here, then just do it at 255. If you know that you need something else, then you'll know that you need something else because you should know how to do this kind of stuff. Next we're going to create the resolve.conf file, and this is to set up the name servers, so these are the DNS servers, and it's how the machine translates a URL into an IP that it can actually access. Use the cat script in the Linux from scratch book to set it up, and then we're going to go ahead and edit it again like we did before with vim. We're just going to delete the domain name line, and we're going to replace the brackets with the IP addresses of your primary name server and secondary name server with the name servers that you want to use. I'm going to be using the default Google ones, which generally work pretty well for me, but if you have some other preference, you can of course use those. So the Googles are 8.8.8.8, .8 and for secondary, 8.8.4.4, .4. but if you have other ones, those will work just fine too, as long as you have something. Run the command in the book to quickly set up the host name. I'm going to call mine sudo lfs. Just make sure you're replacing the brackets with lfs inside with the host name that you want to set to your computer. This isn't really that important unless you're running some specific servers, but it'll make it easier to identify your device on the network. The next section discusses how to create the host file, but we're going to skip down to the cat script to actually set it up, then use vim to edit it once again. We're going to keep the first line pretty much how it is, then we're going to replace the second line with 192.168.0.1, or whatever you set up as your router in the last step, and then follow that by the host name that you set up in the other last step. The aliases can be ignored for now, but if you do want to use them, then you probably know how to use them. Right below that, there's another script to create another version of the host file if you're not going to be configuring a network card, but I'm assuming you're going to want network and internet, so we're going to stick with the first one. Our next section, 7.6, contains a lot to read, so make sure you're going through that so that you understand what exactly is happening, but I'm going to kind of brush through those and just get to the stuff that we have to worry about here. First, we're going to configure sysfinet by just running this cat command. You don't have to edit this file at all, just as long as it's there. Then we're going to configure the system clock, which you can configure if you want to, but for now we're just going to keep it the same and not edit the file at all. Basically what you could add here is any clock parameters and change the UTC time. The default value is 1, which will keep your hardware clock synced with UTC time, but if you want to set it to 0, then it'll be independent and you can sync it to your individual time zone. Configuring the Linux console is an optional step that you can do if you want any kind of special keyboards. Depending on your region, you might want to do this, and you might want to configure it with some different keys and stuff like that. 
There are instructions for quite a few different keyboard layouts that you might want to have, but if you're in the US like me, you don't really have to worry about this step unless you want to, so you can just skip it. We have to set up some regions and encoding. To do this, run locale-a, and this will give you a list of all the different locales and encoding options that you have for your particular operating system. This will be based on what you installed in, I think it was the last episode, but it might have been the one before that. We set it up during the final phase of compiling. For me, I did all of them just to demonstrate what you could do if you wanted all of them or if you weren't sure. So I have a whole bunch, but it'll be less for you. I'm gonna be using the ISO version of the Charm app for English US, but select the one that's appropriate for a region. There's a couple of commands that you want to run using LC underscore all is equal to, and then the locale that you're using. So in my case, that'd be EN for English, underscore US for the United States, and then dot the ISO code. I don't wanna read all of it. And then you can go through the language, charm app, the int cur symbol, and the int prefix. These are gonna output what the locales register to that. So for example, the language would be English. The charm map should be the same output that you got before, so the ISO version, unless you're using UTF-8. Um, and then the currency symbol, US dollars. And then the prefix is what you would use for like a telephone number. So the US is one and other countries are other things. You just wanna make sure that all of that pertains to you correctly so that you have the correct type of region set up in your operating system. Once you've verified that all that works, we're gonna run the cat command at the very bottom to create the slash etc slash profile file. Then we're gonna edit with vim again, and then we're gonna change the lang is equal to, and then basically what we were typing above. So in my case, it's English underscore US dot the charm app, and then modifiers can be ignored unless you need to use those. 7.8 and 7.9 both had two files that you have to create, just run the code in the terminal and it should create them now fine. We don't have to do any configuration here. And then we're on to chapter eight. The first thing in chapter eight is to create the FS tab file. This is the file that takes care of any mounting and things like that that need to be done at the beginning of the operating system. This is also one of the places where you might have errors that might cause your system to not boot. So keep in mind that if you do have errors, this is one of the places that you're going to want to go back to but I'll cover that in a little bit more detail later on when we finally boot into the operating system and I'll give you some examples of what can happen if you have issues and how to hopefully solve them. Go ahead and run the cat command to create the default fstab file and then use vim once again to edit it. Because I don't have a swap partition for this operating system, I'm going to go ahead and delete that entire line, but obviously you're gonna configure it with slash dev slash your swap partition that you set up way back in the first video if you have a swap partition. The first line that it created with the three X's is the default drive that's going to set up as the mount point slash. This is basically filling in the things that you configured back in the very first episode and what you would be using if you were to mount it if you restarted your computer in between. So type, you're gonna replace that with ext4. Keep in mind that you wanna get rid of the FFF and the brackets to replace it with that. The mount point you can keep as just slash and then the file system is going to be slash dev slash, and then in my case, it happens to be SDB, but this is whatever you are using for your operating system. So it's SDB for me because I'm doing it on the entire drive, but if you have a certain partition that's being used, it would be SDB or SDB2, SDB1, could be SDA, SDC with a number followed by it. If you can't quite remember, you can go into disks and check the drive number like that just like we did in the first episode. Keep in mind that if you are gonna be transferring this onto a different computer that's going to use a different drive configuration, you will need to edit the FS tab so that it mounts it correctly. Once that's done, you can save and exit out of Vim and we're gonna get onto compiling the Linux kernel. Go ahead and unpack the tarball for the Linux kernel, then change to the directory, then run make MR proper to make sure we're working in a clean environment. The Linux kernel has tons of things that you can enable and play around with that will give your operating system different aspects from devices to even support for Android. To get the defaults that it's gonna recommend for the current system that you're running on, run make def config. And if you're going for just kind of a bare bones system that you just wanna get up and running, I would definitely recommend that and go with that for now. There are two settings that we have to make sure work so that it boots correctly. To access these, run make menu config and you'll be greeted by a kind of half GUI that shows different options. Go to device drivers, then generic driver options, then scroll down to these two settings. You wanna make sure that support for U event helper is turned off. The star indicates whether it's on or off and just press space to toggle it. Then go to maintain a dev tempfs file system to mount at slash dev and enable this by having the little star appear in the box. 
When you're done, you can use the arrow keys to go over to the save function and save it, then run make and it'll compile it. This can take anywhere from 3 to 49 SBUs, depending on what you're enabling and what packages you have compiling alongside it. When you're done, you also want to run make modules underscore install to install all the modules that you may have enabled. At this point, if you have a separate boot partition, make sure you go and mount it. Then we're going to copy a whole bunch of files over to that boot partition or your boot folder if you don't have one to make sure that everything's in the correct location. At the very bottom, there's a script that you can run to configure the Linux module load order. So just go ahead and run that and then we can set up grub. Go ahead and run the three commands up top. You don't really need to edit these. Then go ahead and run grub dash install then slash dev and then slash SDA in my case, but this is the location that you want to boot off of. For me, I'm installing it on the main partition, which is going to delete the current bootloader, and it's gonna make it so that I can't access the operating system I'm currently in, but that's just fine. It'll go over to the other partition to mount into the LFS system. If you're on an actual live CD now and are installing LFS to slash dev slash SDA and then a certain partition, you can also install it to slash dev slash SDA and it'll overwrite the bootloader, but it's not currently there, so it'll just boot into the LFS. Next, we can create the grub configuration file and then go ahead and edit it. The first thing that we're gonna edit is the set root here, and this should be pointing to the same drive that you have LFS installed. Grub uses its own naming scheme for this, but it's gonna point to the same drive. For me, it's HD1 because that points to SDB, but if Linux from scratch is, for example, on the SDA2 partition, you're gonna wanna write HD0 and then comma the drive partition. Next, go down a few lines and we're gonna set the same thing for the root, but this time it's the normal naming scheme. So for me, this is slash dev slash SDB. This is another configuration file that we can actually edit in Grub when we start booting in, but the changes won't be permanent. So if you have issues, you're gonna wanna change it there and then come back to this to edit it permanently, but this is one of the things that can go wrong and if you have issues booting into your Linux operating system, you can revisit this script to try to change the drives around a little bit and make sure that it works. Go ahead and log out of the root, unmount the file systems, and then go ahead and shut down dash R now. This will restart and hopefully you will see your Linux from scratch system showing up in Grub. Just hit enter and hopefully you will have successfully created your own operating system and will now be booting into it. If you aren't so lucky, then I will go through a few of the common issues that I think you could encounter and hopefully solutions to fix them. Probably the most likely issue that you're gonna run into is that it can't find the bootable media. That's a fairly easy fix, so go ahead and reboot your computer, then at the grub menu, press C to get to the command line. Type set root is equal to, and then the beginning of a parentheses, then you can type tab to do an auto code complete and it'll give you the options. As you can see, I have HD0 and HD1, and you can set this to any of the options that you see, and you can try them all out. If you set a certain one back when we were configuring Grub, then that one probably doesn't work if you're having issues now, so try setting it to the other one. Next, you can escape back into Grub and try booting into it. Because I changed it to a different drive and it was working earlier, it's gonna say I have the error of the unknown file system, which you may have been seeing before, but hopefully if you were seeing that before and you changed it, it should have fixed it. If it looks as if it's starting to go into the Linux operating system, but then you get an error that it can't find the bootable media or something along those lines, then you're gonna to want to edit the other parameter that we set in the grub configuration. To do this, use E to get into the editor mode, and this will allow you to quickly temporarily edit the grub configuration. As you can see, we have the same option that we did before, so change the root is equal to slash dev slash sdb or sda to something that you might think will work instead, then you can try rebooting and hopefully that fixes it. If you're still having issues booting into it, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible to help you all out. There are plenty of communities on the Ubuntu forums and Linux forums and places like Stack Exchange, which have great communities of very intelligent people, probably more intelligent than me, that will hopefully be happy to answer your questions and hopefully you can figure out what is causing your issues from them or down in the comments. The last step I'm gonna show you is that if you're on a virtual machine, then you will need to go into the settings down to the network and change the network mode to bridge mode to get it to work. And suddenly on the LFS machine, I can do things with the internet and now have access to it, which is pretty fantastic. So that is about it for this episode. I may be doing another one again, but this is kind of the finale. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you got your operating system up and running, or if not, hopefully you can get it up and running very soon. Thank you so much for watching and sticking with this series. I'm probably going to be making a BLFS, so Beyond LFS system, in the future sometime. 
And if you would like to support that, that would be super great. Feel free to use my Amazon link, which you can find in the description of every video or the description on the channel. Just bookmark that and use it whenever you shop on Amazon, and I'll get a small kickback for whatever you purchase at no additional cost for you. That would really help out a lot, and keep in mind that any revenue goes straight back into the channel to bring you more and higher quality content. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.